Last time we got to meet Sam Fredrickson and we heard the name Jimmy. Well, we'll find more out about him next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Welcome to another episode of the Ex Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Burl, and I appreciate you joining with us. Uh, as I mentioned, we have Sam Fredrickson still here, and uh, so oftentimes we just do half hour yeah. interviews, but I could tell there were other things that we needed to talk about that we hadn't, and, and uh, some important things I think that, that really help give uh, maybe certain people in the audience or those listening. Uh, a perspective that maybe they don't always get and so uh, and we learned from Sam last time that he's had challenges in his life he's a young man still and um, what else you very active in the church your family's very active temple workers mm -hmm. and a bishop your mm -hmm. father and um, but Sam just there were things uh, that were challenging and living the commandments and mm -hmm. and so he didn't feel like Mormonism was a good fit Still had the hope, maybe that Mormonism was true. Yeah, and that I'd maybe say so. somewhere along the way you'd come back and I wouldn't have been surprised. The light. Yeah. Wouldn't have been surprised. Yeah. I think that's probably fair to say. But uh, you end up again with some challenges and into a, a care facility or a yeah, hospital yeah. for a little while, and uh, kind of after hitting rock bottom, as mm -hmm. we learned. And so along comes Jimmy. Yes. Yeah, so. so go back to telling us he. He had been sedated because he was going to have to leave the mm -hmm. hospital because of insurance issues. Yeah. But he comes in, sits down, and opens up. And there, yeah. Starts talking to you. Just talking. And, and so, like I had mentioned um, last time, I was in this kind of pseudo proto apologist stance of, you know, well, Jimmy, just because this is happening doesn't mean God loves you. And we, we just talked and talked and talked for hours, really. And we ran the gamut of those really, I feel like, base core questions that, that a new believer would have to the point where I was tapping into to something within myself that at this point, I'm not sure if it was just me talking. Does that make sense? But converting him to Mormonism? No, not necessarily. Okay. Just trying to, to shore up his belief in God because I okay. was like, he's not going to survive out there in this current state. And if, if he loses that, who knows? So and here God's giving you an opportunity to witness to him, basically. Yeah, it's, it's almost as if, um, you know, in the Gospels, when Caiaphas says, it's better for one man to die than for a nation to perish. Yeah. Nation to perish. And um, John says that he didn't say that of his own accord. He was <laughs> prophesying in that moment. And I almost sometimes think of it like that. Like, I was saying these things and, and I was thinking them, but I was speaking from a position of faith that I didn't know I still had. And so That's fascinating. It was it was a wild time. It really <laughs> was. And so we spent all night talking. He goes to bed, I go to bed, and the next morning, this is what just blew my mind is the next morning he is still told he has to leave and he goes. And it's no big deal. And I say, Jimmy you were like a, a raging bull. Like they had to put you down. Yeah. What's changed? What's happened? And he said to me, and I, I remember this clear as day through the last six years and everything that came with it. He said to me, I just guess, I guess I just did what I came here to do. You know, I guess I've, I've just got what I needed. And he left. And I was like, what does that mean? This yeah. is, this is insane. What are you talking about, Jimmy? Did he you, feel like he met God then or? I, but Don't He know. certainly was at peace, though. He was peaceful. He was ready for it. Whatever the next thing was, he was ready for it. Maybe whatever you said yeah. calmed him. And... It's, it's possible. And it was a cryptic, it was a cryptic piece of a puzzle that later, as I went on my life, kind of fell into place. Because I left the hospital a day later, and I came out, I said, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to do drugs. I'm not going to drink at least for, for two or three months and, and go from there, even though I was only 19 at the time. Um, I'm just going to try to, to make it from here, you know? And, and I wasn't going to live morally. I didn't think I needed any moral or ethical code. I just knew that what I had been doing was bad for me. Uh -huh. And so I was working the drive through at this restaurant I worked at, and I hated the drive through as many people do. And 
I had decided it was a bad day and I had decided I wasn't going to look or acknowledge the people in the drive-thru. Yep. I was your personal little uh, yep, thing. <laughs> my own little bubble. Everybody's been through a drive-thru with this kind of an employee, I guarantee it, where they're just done for the day and they're just there to be a robot and take your money and give you your food. And that's what I was doing. <laughs> and so when this truck pulls up and I see somebody get out of the truck and start bending down and then coming up and bending down, I just kind of shook my head and was like, what is going on? And so I open the window and I'm not looking at this gentleman and he speaks to me in a really, I mean, he's got a very distinctive voice. It's a very, very deep voice. And he says, I've got some pennies for you. And I was like, what? And he, that's what he had been doing. He'd been down Gathering on the ground grabbing. Pennies. Yeah, he had dropped his change or somebody else had. And so he gave me the pennies and I said, thank you. And I grabbed his card. And when I was little, I was in a Wendy's. And uh, uh, the cashier had taken my mother's card and read her name from the card. And then when she gave it back to her, she addressed her by her name. And to me, that was magic. And so that's what I always tried to do, is to learn people's names, even when I was in a bad mood, so I could say, you know, oh, here's your food, Bob, or, or whatever. And so I look at the card, and it's Jimmy's first and last name. <laughs> it's James, I'm not going to say his last name, just yeah. for privacy in case. And I am just awestruck. I don't know what's going on. And that he's sitting there in this He's sitting car, there. It's a beautiful car. truck. It's like a brand new truck. And I finally say, I need to look at this person. <laughs> and so I look over and he, there is a man there who's about six foot four, 300 to 350. He's got gray hair, but it's not long and wispy. It's, it's a full head of hair and it's combed. He's got all of his teeth and his skin looks great. And yet, when he spoke to me, I was able to put it together that that was Jimmy's voice that I had been sitting with for hours. And I looked at him and I had not told him my name. I, I can swear to that. <laughs> and he looks me in the eyes and he says, howdy, Sam. And I just like backed up and I gave him my, his card back and I gave him his food. And he said, I'll be seeing you. And I just froze. And as he drives away, I see his license plate. And it's the, the license plate with the cowboy on it. I think it's a Wyoming license yeah. plate. And he had always talked about how his best days of his life were as a cowboy. And he even made us all watch Lonesome Dove just to prove how much he loved cowboys. At the, uh, at the hospital. <laughs> at the hospital, yep. It was on cable and we had a wonderful, like it's like a two and a half hour movie. Okay. It was a wonderful time. And I just stopped. And the entire world just stopped. And I looked at my manager and I said, I gotta take, I gotta take a break. I'm really sorry. I gotta go. Did you try to chase the truck down? Or? I didn't know. I just, I had to get out of there because I knew, I knew what my next step was. And my next step was to call the only person that I knew that really believed in God that I was really close to and could be honest with. And that was the woman who would become my wife, Katie. She was the only good Christian in my life. She was the only person that I felt I could really bear myself to at that time. And so I called her and I said, Katie, I think I just, I think I just saw an angel. I don't know what just happened. And I told her the whole story. And at that point, I mean, I don't even think I had mentioned when I got out of the hospital, I didn't tell anybody about Jimmy. I didn't tell anybody about our heart to heart because it had been completely, you know, it was an incidental thing. And as I told her all of this, she paused for a second and she said, so, well, when I was about 17, 16 or 17. And you've known Katie since middle school, Oh yeah, right? since middle school. We had never yeah. been romantically involved because she would never date a non-Christian because she is a good Christian woman. <laughs> and I love you. And when I, but when I was 16 or 17, when we knew each other and were talking, I had gone through a very dark time as well of spiritual evil or mental illness or com combination. Yeah. And she told me that since those days, two years ago, two or three years ago, her mother had prayed every single day that an angel <laughs> would come and visit me. Into your life. And I was pushed down. I was pushed to my knees in the parking lot. And at that moment, I didn't know the first thing about being a biblical Christian. I didn't know the first thing about knowing a biblical God, but I knew that 
the God that her mother had been praying to was the God who had brought Jimmy into my life. And as I've gone these few years, I know this sounds entirely crazy. I'm totally aware of that. I think it sounds fantastic. And I've gone through and I've played it over in my head and I've said, is it the same guy? Did I maybe get his last name wrong or, or what's going on? Maybe I did say my name when he rolled up to the... And what it comes down to at this point in my life is that if it wasn't an angel, that makes it almost more unbelievable to me that every single thing worked out exactly how it needed to to get me on my knees in a parking lot after two years of being extremely lost. And only God could do that. And only God could do that. I realized that I've always said I don't believe in coincidences and this was the only thing in my, my moments of doubt that I would say, well, maybe this was a coincidence. And I said, why am I doing that? Why do I, why can't I just believe? Mm -hmm. And so... Especially when mom, mom mom-in-law has been praying for an angel. I am so blessed by my in-laws. They have been an amazing, just this, they have just been amazing Christians who have taught me what it is to be an amazing Christian. So what happens after this? Do you start to, do you tell Katie, of course, about all this? Yeah, literally, so I... I'm still on the phone as I'm on my knees in the parking lot. Really? And I said to her after a moment or two of silence, I said, can I come to church with you? And she was like, yes, please. Yeah. She, she. Had she ever invited you before? Yes. So when I was in, when I was very young or not very young, 17, maybe I had gone with her to a youth group gathering Mm. and it was amazing. I mean, I was just sobbing the entire time. It, the The music was playing, and it was so powerful, and the lyrics were so powerful. And we talk about feeling the spirit as yeah. Mormons. You know, we feel the spirit move within us, and and it prompts you. And that was the the point I had felt the spirit most strongly in my entire life. I could not stop crying. One of my friends, also from high school, was there. His name's Ian. And Ian came to me and like wrapped me up and was like, it's okay, man, I understand. God's so great. And I was like, I don't even know if I believe in God. What are you talking about? And it was amazing. But other than that, I had never gone to a Christian church. I had never gone to a Christian service. So you go to one? So I went to, I well, I went to the Hastings. I don't know if, do you guys had, did you have Hastings here? They were just like a bookstore. Oh. They shut down. It's tragic. And <laughs> I, I went to the Hastings and I bought the first Bible I found, which was the new King James Version. Okay. Because I had always read the KJV and I was like, I don't want that, but I don't want one of these Bibles that just talks like a normal book. Yeah. So I'm going to go for the new King James Version. And, and I started reading my Bible two or three hours every day. And there were days when I, there was one day specifically when I overslept and I had missed my opportunity to, to read my Bible that day. And I was so distraught and I called, <laughs> or, and then two minutes later I got a call from my assistant manager who said, hey man, we're pretty slow. Why don't you just come in two hours early today, or two hours late today? Gave you a chance. To Gave me a chance to read. And so from there I went to church and I read my Bible and I did have like your typical born again moment. I had the moment of, reading, I was reading in, I, I believe it was Ephesians 2, and talking about the reconciliation of the old man into the new, and this and that. Grace is in there too. Yes, I and think, grace yeah. is in there too. And Katie had mentioned, you know, if you want to be saved, you pray this prayer. And, and so I didn't really know what it was. All I knew was that I was supposed to say to God, I want to be saved, <laughs> and he would do the rest. And I was reading my Bible at that point, and I was like, I think this is it. I think this I'm ready. This is what ready. I'm supposed to pray for. Yeah, and so I, I knelt down and I prayed. And another thing that led me to that point is that as, so this was such an amazing time because Katie and her friends would come. I lived in the basement of this house, and I had a little piano, and we would just sit and we'd play piano and we'd read the Bible and we'd talk about God for just an hour or two, every other day or really? so. It was amazing. It was unlike anything I've ever had before or after. And during these times, I just continually felt that this is the right place with the right people. And as I look back and I say, why didn't I go back to Mormonism? You know, once I was sure there was a God, once I was sure that that Jesus Christ had died for my sins, why didn't I go back to being a Mormon? And I think it was that fellowship and that community that as a Mormon, I had always been told that these people have some of the truth, but not all of the truth. 
or Christians. Yeah, you know. or they're it, worst scenarios where they're the Church of the Devil, yeah. and <laughs> right. and I just said that can't be. It cannot be that what I'm feeling is only part of what God wants me to feel. It's only part of the joy He wants for me because this is greater than anything I've ever. Have you through. understood grace as a Mormon? No, it was I, it was very transactional. You know, it was very, very, very. Uh, you do good and you get good, and you do bad and and heaven forbid you get bad. You know, and one of the most life changing things I've ever read. Have you ever read anything by A. W. Tozer? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So he he in his <clears throat> book The Meditations on the Trinity, he wrote, if God is love. And if God is loving, it means he is endlessly loving. If God is patient, it means he is endlessly Endless. patient. And I suddenly just realized that this thought, that there was going to come a day that God got sick of it. And that God said, no more. You've made the same sin 52 times. 53 is out. I'm not forgiving it anymore. That was something that for whatever reason, that's what I came out and of Mormonism with. You realize God's yeah. love is endless love. It's endless, yeah. yeah. But I, I remember in Mormonism thinking, I can only make the same mistake so many times before he turns from a loving father into an angry father, you know? Yeah. And that was a really life-changing thing. I mean, yeah. I'm sure most people watching this have, have <laughs> felt something like that. And it's so amazing. you still, at this point, did you had a... Um, you didn't really know any bad news of Mormonism. No. So, and, and you were just learning this good news. Yeah. And reading the Bible, it sounds like you were very faithful and childlike in, in reading yeah. it and trying to understand it. Yeah, I went through the Old Testament and I was like, I'm so excited to read the Old Testament. And really? I was, yeah, I don't know why, I was just stoked on it. And I still am. But I went through it almost certain that as we got to these laws about the priesthood and we about the temple and about the sacrificial systems, yeah. almost certain there would at least be a clue there, right? It's sacred, not secret, so we don't need to hide it, yeah. but there would be some sort of a clue in the text that would lead me to believing that what happened in church temples was, was the right, true thing. And in Mormon temples? In Mormon yeah. temples, yeah. And so I was very surprised when I found that that was not Which the case. I couldn't find anything. There was but, not yeah. anything, anything close, you know. Kind of wonder about the restoration part of it then. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What are we restoring? Yeah. Are we restoring or are we building something new? Blood sacrifices yeah. in the temple. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Katie said just the other day, if, if you tried to do what they do in the Old Testament in the Mormon temples, you'd be arrested <laughs> straight up. <laughs> if you took in a lamb for slaughter. Animal cruelty. Yeah, they <laughs> yeah. would just kick you out. And so... I, for two or three years, I still trusted that the leaders of the church and that Joseph Smith were doing what was right by their conscience and that they had maybe got a little confused and maybe they added some things, but at the end of the day, this was a, a good, honest man who, who died for his faith and all of that. And it wasn't... Uh, when did the CES letter, are you headed there? That's where I'm headed. Okay, <laughs> yeah. tell, tell us it's, about it's this. It's a necessary stop on, I think, every <laughs> ex-Mormon's train. Um, I, so my older brother, Jacob, the one who's, who's out of the church with me, he frequented the ex-Mormon subreddit on Reddit. Mm. And he would just tell me these little things that he found. And I told him multiple times, Jake, I just don't want to talk about that. I, does, I don't care. All, I've, all I need is Jesus. All I've got is Jesus. I don't need to be mad, and I don't need to bring up the past. And then he just kept saying things that were too enticing for me to not follow up. And so I went on the ex-Mormon subreddit, and within like 10 minutes I was reading the CES letter, and within two hours I, my entire perception of the church leadership, never, never the members, but the church leadership was corrupt. Something's wrong. Something is wrong, and they have to know. If all else fails, the prophet himself has to know that this is not what's going on. And I think you bring up a point, a, a good point, about not really wanting to maybe force yourself to go there. Yeah. But we have loved ones in Mormonism yeah. still, and they have, they don't even know what they don't know, as has yeah. been said so many times. And so when you learn these things, it confirms the fact that, okay, the Bible is trustworthy and I can, yeah. I feel like grace is important and what Jesus did for me, but 
they need to know that what they're believing isn't isn't fair. <laughs> isn't yeah, right. Yeah, and they need to come to Jesus and come to to trust the Bible. Exactly. Even if just for a more freeing yeah, for life. the freedom and the yeah. liberty and like you were saying when you sin the the pipeline of priesthood mm -hmm. authority you know that's one of the scriptures yeah. I think 121 or something and you know and uh, so we don't we feel like we lose our authority yes. when we sin and and and, and I yeah. had to sit and ask if I as a 14 year old making sin after sin was unworthy to participate in my priesthood office how could it be that the members of the church doing, or not the members, sorry, the, the presidents of the church, yeah. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, how could it possibly be that they were worthy enough to be the prophet and to have the keys of the kingdom? And it just didn't add up. Yeah. And, and that, I think, was the final nail in the coffin for me of saying there is no, and, and I hadn't been considering it, but I had never really shut that door all the way and by the time I was done with the CES letter I had nailed it shut. In fact there was a little contention with you and Katie. Over, yeah yeah we over. would we would disagree and and she would say things like you know it's just not biblical it's just not Christian it's just not this and that and I'd say I don't want to hear it they're doing their best <laughs> they know and they are and they always have been and especially well, they're sincere people they are I extremely mean, loving and yeah that's the thing, is that when I look at my parents especially, they are love. They are always loving to me. They have taken in my friends and my brother's friends who are not members, who have drug issues. Good and for them. They are amazing, wonderful people. And so when Katie would talk about Mormonism being false, I instantly got defensive for my family and for my parents. And I said, well, no, my parents couldn't be, you know, this and that and the other thing. And I just realized that that's not what's going on. You know, just because Mormonism is false, it doesn't mean that anything about my parents and who they are has changed. You know, mm -hmm. what it means is that there is a, a system that I need to work to help them yeah. and, and not just them, right. everyone, you know, yeah. and so I went through this period of, of the Bible kind of unraveling for me. I had this this same fear. It's joyful though, isn't it? Oh yes, yeah. yeah. Well, it's joyful now. Yeah. But I had this fear that that I would find the CES letter, but for the Bible. You know, I was afraid oh. that there was something out there that would prove that Christianity was all a hoax too, and it was just started by you know I some think, guys to get power. I think power. that's natural. Isn't yeah, it? I was so scared, and it's it's because you're in a spiritually abusive place that once you realize that that truth is polluted, you think that there is no You have to question objective. everything. Yeah. yeah. And so I went through years of not looking up things, of, of intentionally keeping my blinders on because I was so afraid that if I took them off, I would see that Christianity wasn't true either. And then I'd lose my wife and I'd lose everything I had. Yeah. And so one day I went, finally I went to the ex-Christian subreddit and it was so entirely different. It was just hurt people who had been hurt by Christians in their church, who had been hurt by this and that, but there was no silver bullet. There was no CES letter. There was nothing they could share that undermined my faith. And as soon as that happened, I stopped being afraid. You know, the Bible, I had unraveled it in my mind and I had gotten just to the brink of thinking, what if this isn't true either? And when I finally looked over, I fell back and it just, came back up. It just re-raveled and I've been able to do a lot of study and a lot of preparation and I'm actually looking at going to school to become a pastor. And, Good for you. and it's because there is truth and it's because the Bible is true. Well, and when the foundation is built on Jesus, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about yeah. that. There are witnesses to him and, yeah. uh, and, and the stories and, and everything are, yeah. are trustworthy. Timothy Keller, uh, a great the great pastor said, you know, instead of giving us like watertight evidence and watertight proof and this and that for Christianity, we've gotten a watertight person. We have the person of Jesus Christ who cannot be contradicted, who cannot be seen to be false, who cannot be, you know, he's either a crazy person <laughs> or he's the Lord of the universe and he died for our sins. He doesn't leave it open for anything else and we shouldn't either. And I know that he's not a crazy person. <laughs> well, and there's such a freedom in that. Yeah. And such a joy to have that kind of uh, uh, feeling. Yeah. 
Well, gosh, what are you doing now? You 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 say you're thinking of going to to. Uh, yeah, so I'm. Is I'm, that in Boise? It's in Boise. Yeah, so I'm getting I'm getting my degree in history right now, just a little two year degree. Good for you. Then I'm gonna go to it's uh, called NNU. It's Northwest Nazarene University, and I'm gonna get a ideally a degree in biblical literature and Christian ministry and you then maybe go from there. Believe you're even thinking no, this way. I, I really, mean, seven years ago. I, I know. Yeah, I mean, or a few years I, ago, right? I keep telling people, if you think that people can't change, I would just like to tell you that what I'm most excited to do this year is to go to a country music concert and I'm studying to become a pastor. <laughs> and if that doesn't mean that I've changed, I don't know what it, what can. You know? Well, I love what Paul says about becoming a new creature. Yes. And you definitely define that uh, yeah. 100%. It's, it's wild. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so we're just about at the end yeah. again. That's so quick. Um, what would you tell your family and friends? And but, you know, the thing of it is, is I don't know, like, where anybody is. I, my family may never see this. They may see it. My friends may never see it. They may, who knows how this is going to end up. I don't know where anyone is. And I don't want to sit here and, and pull out the bad news. I don't want to sit here and, and talk about the book of Abraham and polyandry and all of that kind of stuff. If there's one message I have for Mormons, it's the same message that I have for every person in my life. And that is that the God who created the universe created you and he created you because he has loved you since before you were even a thing. He loved you before you existed. And because of that love, instead of remaining high and holy and far away, he condescended to us and he got his hands dirty, not because he, he you know, had to, to die or else he wants to smite you or something, not because he wants you gone, but because he wants you with him so badly that he'd do anything. He would do anything to bring you to him. And the same way that Moses lifted up that bronze snake in the wilderness and all they had to do is look at him and believe the same thing is true of Jesus Christ. He that believeth in me hath everlasting life. Exactly. Yeah. You just have to look at him, want him, and he'll give you everything. He loves you. He has gone home to be with God, and he is preparing a place for you right now. And if you want to be there, all you have to do is want him and love him. And that's the message for Mormons, the message for non-Mormons. It really for is. Everyone. That's a good point. It's, it's, it's the only thing that I know to be true, 100%. Well, Sam, thanks for coming yeah. over from... Boise, and we're going to get to meet Katie next, yeah. and I'm happy to, or be fun to talk to her. And anyway, good luck in all you're doing. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you coming, and we'll see you next time on the Next Modern Files.